What's up, everybody? Welcome back. This is your boy, Tech G, and here is another video on CompTIA IT Fundamentals. And we're going to be talking about common internal computing components. So in this video, you will learn about the purpose of common internal computing components, such as the motherboard or the system board, firmware, BIOS, RAM, CPU, storage, GPU, cooling, and the NIC card. So let's get into it. All right, first things first, we have the motherboard. So a motherboard is a printed circuit board on the foundation of a computer, which is the biggest board in the computer chassis. Motherboards connect the CPU, memory, storage devices, and input-output devices to each other with a combination of built-in ports, sockets, cables, and cables. Motherboards are used in desktop workstations, servers, all-in-one desktops, and laptop computers. So what you're looking at in this picture, that is a typical full-size ATX form factor motherboard. And you will learn what that stuff is in later courses. Next, we have SATA ports, S-A-T-A -A ports. SATA, also known as Serial ATA, stands for Serial Advanced Technology Attachment. It is an interface used to connect ATA hard drives to a computer's motherboard. Some motherboards have front-facing SATA ports used, for, um, used with mass storage devices such as DVD drives, SATA hard drives, and SSD drives while others have top-facing SATA ports. So these are the, these little blue things right here are what you connect the hard drives to on the motherboard. Next, we have port clusters. So desktop motherboards have a port cluster that is visible at the rear of the system, which allows for external devices to plug into these ports. Motherboards can vary in size, which is known as a form factor. Um, they can also vary when it comes to number and types of card slots, number and types of memory modules, and the number and types of ports available from the rear of the system and other features as well. So here, you guys should be familiar with this. This is what you plug all of your cables into to bring your computer to life for the most part. Next, we have expansion slots. An expansion slot, also known as a bus slot or expansion port, is a connection or port inside a computer on the motherboard or riser card. It provides an installation point for a hardware expansion card to be connected. Motherboards for desktop computers have at least one expansion slot and most have three or more. Expansion slots are used to add cards that provide additional ports or replace low performance parts with higher performance parts. Next, we're going to talk about the laptop motherboard. So laptop motherboards provide the exact same functionality as that of a desktop motherboard. The major difference is that on laptop motherboards, rather than the ports being clustered, they are attached to the edge of the laptop. And ribbon cables are used to connect the display, keyboard, and touch touchpad to the motherboard. The processor is cooled by a thermal module connected to a fan. So that is a laptop, a standard, typical laptop motherboard. Next, we're going to talk about BIOS and firmware. So BIOS stands for Basic Input Output System, and it is a ROM chip a read-only memory chip found on motherboards that allows you to access and set up your computer system at the most basic level. The BIOS is responsible for locating the drive that has the operating system, setting the processor and memory speed, setting ports for drives and external connections, and much more. When you first turn on your computer, the BIOS, also known as a type of firmware, but the BIOS runs programs that activate essential parts of the computer. Later in the startup process, the BIOS firmware hands responsibility over to the operating system to finish the startup process. Firmware is a software program or set of instructions programmed on a hardware device. 
It provides the necessary instructions for how the device communicates with other computer hardware. You will come across a term called UEFI, which stands for Unified Extensible Firmware Initiative, which basically refers to an enhanced type of firmware used on almost all desktop and laptop computers starting back in 2014. UEFI firmware can be navigated with the mouse or a keyboard. It supports hard drives up to 2.2 terabytes and larger and provides faster startup as well as additional features. So here is a screenshot of what you will see if you were to go into the BIOS and start trying to configure your computer. The thing about this is you're going to have to use your keys and your tab button to navigate this type of menu. Here is what a UFI looks like. You can use your mouse and click on things to make magic happen with your computer so you can have the best computer in the world. So this is what a typical UEFI uh, interface looks like. Next, we're going to talk about the CMOS. So CMOS stands for Complementary Metal Oxide Semiconductor. It is a technology used to produce integrated circuits. CMOS circuits are found in several types of electronic components, including microprocessors, batteries, and digital camera image sensors. The specific settings used by the BIOS are stored in the CMOS chip, whose contents are maintained by a small battery on the motherboard. And that is a picture of the battery right there. Next, we're going to talk about RAM. RAM stands for Random Access Memory. It is also known as Main Memory, Primary Memory, memory or System Memory. And it's a hardware device that allows information to be stored and retrieved on a computer. RAM is a temporary storage used by apps, also known as programs, that are run by the CPU. RAM is also a temporary storage for data being used by the apps. The contents of RAM vanish, which is known as volatile memory, meaning it's not permanent. And as soon as the system is turned off, the contents disappear. But um, well, let me repeat that. The contents of RAM vanish, which is known as volatile memory, as soon as the system is turned off. So changed and new data must be saved to a permanent storage device known as a hard drive. The amount of RAM used by an app varies according to whether the app is idle or is being used to view, create, or modify a file. The larger the memory in a device, the more programs that could be run at the same time and the larger the data files that can be stored in memory. When a system runs out of RAM, excess program code or data can be stored in temporary files on the system's mass storage device, also known as a hard drive or an SSD. Adding more RAM to a system that has upgradable memory is a good way to improve system performance because RAM is much faster than storage devices. So in this picture here, you're looking at three DDR RAM sticks. These are just basically little sticks you stick into certain spots on the motherboard to do all the things I just talked about. Next, we're going to talk about the CPU stands for central processing unit. And you could think of this as the brain of the computer. But the CPU, which is also known as a processor, central processor or a microprocessor, it handles all instructions it receives from hardware and software running on the computer. The CPU is also responsible for running the operating system and the apps. Using data connections built into the motherboard, the CPU communicates with storage, input-output devices, and the temporary workspace in RAM to access specific operating system tasks and app functions, as well as to save and retrieve files. There are two types of uh, CPUs that you need to be concerned with when it comes to the CompTIA IT Fundamentals exam. The first one is called an ARM processor, which stands for Advanced Risk Machines. ARM processors, they're pretty much used by mobile phones, tablets, and small single board computers such as the Raspberry Pi. And then you need to be concerned with processors that run Windows and Mac OSs. 
that use one of the following types, either a 32-bit processor or a 64-bit processor. The type, speed, and features of the CPU have the biggest impacts on a particular computer's overall performance. So let's talk about the ARM. Once again, ARM stands for Advanced Risk Machine. So the ARM processor is a 32-bit risk processor, meaning it is using the RISC uh, ISA platform. RISC, RISC stands for Reduced Instruction Set Computer, and ISA stands for Instruction Set Architecture. ARM processors are microprocessors and are widely used in, in many of the mobile phones sold each year. As many as 98% of mobile phones have an ARM processor. They are also used in PDAs, which are personal digital assistants, digital media and music uh, layers. And they're, they're used in handheld gaming systems, calculators, and even on some computer hard drives. All right, let's talk about a system on a chip. A system on a chip, also known as a SOC, combines the required electronic circuits of various computer components onto a single integrated chip. SOC is a complete electronic substrate system that may contain analog, digital, mixed signal, or radio frequency functions. Its components usually include a GPU, graphical processing unit, a CPU central processing unit that may be multi-core and it also has some sister system memory, also known as RAM. This is one of the main reasons as to why motherboards for desktops and laptop computers, uh, motherboards are so much bigger than uh, laptop computers is because of this ARM based circuit board. Let's talk about 32 bit processors. So, a 32-bit processor is a type of CPU architecture that is capable of transferring 32 bits of data per clock cycle. So in layman's terms, it is the amount of information that your CPU can process each time it performs an operation. You could think of this architecture as a road that's 32 lanes wide where only 32 quote-unquote vehicles or bits of data can go through an intersection at a time. A 32-bit processor can also support a 16-bit operating system as well. Let's talk about 32-bit processors for laptops. So laptop versions of 32-bit processors were specifically designed to use less power than those made for desktops, workstations, and servers. They are generally not interchangeable with desktop processors as they use different sockets and different cooling systems. 32-bit processors for workstations. So a workstation refers to an individual computer or a group of computers used by a single user to perform work. Workstation processors are designed to support one or more CPUs on a motherboard and to be optimized for computer-aided design, also known as CAD, rather than gaming, as with desktop processors. Workstation processors typically have larger memory caches than desktop processors. 32-bit processors for servers. A server is a software hardware device, software or hardware device, that accepts and responds to requests made over a network. The device that makes the request and receives a response from the server is called a client. Server processors are designed to perform heavy workloads and often two or more processors are used on a single motherboard. Server processors typically have memory caches that are larger than workstation processors. Let's talk about 64-bit processors. A 64-bit processor, which is an which is a Intel x86 processor that also runs 64-bit software, is also known as an x64 or x86-64 processor, but it supports both 64-bit and 32-bit operating systems and apps. A 64-bit processor supports much larger amounts of RAM than a 32-bit processor, and as a consequence, can work with much larger amounts of data at the same time. 
Most 64-bit processors also feature two or more processor cores. Each processor core runs like a separate processor. All right, so let's talk about 64-bit processors for laptops. Uh, laptop processors from Intel and AMD have also supported 64-bit operations for over a decade. Laptop processors typically have smaller memory caches, slower processor clock speeds, and other optimizations for running on battery power. And they fit into different sockets than their desktop counterparts. Laptops are more popular than desktop computers, and there are a bewildering variety of laptop processors on the market. Next, we have 64-bit processors for workstations. Most Intel, Exeon, or Xeon, I can't remember how it's pronounced, but and all AMD Opteron workstation processors support X64 compared to 64-bit desktop processors. They are optimized for 3D rendering and CAD support. Systems used for workstations usually feature 16 gigabits or more of RAM, high-end video cards made for accurate rendering, hard drives using serial attached SCSI, also known as SASE, and SATA Express, and two or more 27-inch or larger displays. 64-bit processors for servers. So most Intel, Exeon, and AMD, Opteron, and Epic EPYC server processors run on 64-bit operating systems and apps. These processors are optimized for use in dual processor or multi-processor operations and for very high-speed networking. Gigabit or 10 gig LAN support, RAID, array mass storage, and optimization for media streaming and file sharing are typical features. Let's talk about the GPU, which stands for Graphics Processing Unit. A GPU is a programmable, programmable logic chip specialized for display functions. The GPU renders images, animations, and video for the computer screen. The GPUs are currently found in two places. Many processors made for desktop computers, as well as almost all processors made for laptops and other form factors include GPU functions. Also, for higher performance in gaming, 3D rendering, and CAD, cards with discrete GPUs are used in desktops and workstations and some gaming laptops. If the GPU is built into the processor, the GPU typically uses a portion of system memory. If the GPU is built into a card, the card has its own memory. Desktop computers that support CPUs with integrated GPUs have video outputs in their port cluster. However, these computers can also use graphic cards similar to the one shown on the screen here. And that is a picture of a high performance GPU, by the way. Let's talk about storage. Computer data storage is a technology consisting of computer components and recording media that are used to retain data. The operating system, apps, and most data are stored in an internal drive. Two types of drives are used for system storage in desktops, laptops, and similar computers. You would have a hard drive and you would have a solid state drive, also known as an SSD. Hard drives, a hard drive, a hard disk drive, which is also known as just a hard drive or an HD or an HDD, is a non-volatile data storage device. That means it can keep data for a long period of time. It is usually installed internally in a computer attached directly to the disk controller of the computer's motherboard. It contains one or more spinning metal or glass platers that are coated with a magnetic substance. Read write heads move across the platter to read, write, and rewrite data as needed. Typical desktop hard drives are 3.5 inches wide, whereas laptop hard drives are 2.5 inches wide and are also shorter in height. Both types connect to the motherboard via SATA connections. Typical storage capacities range from 500 gigabytes to four terabytes or larger. 
Let's talk about solid state drives, also known as SSD. A solid state drive, like I said, is known as a SSD or a solid state device or a solid state disk, is a device that uses integrated circuit assemblies to store data persistently, typically using flash memory and functioning as secondary storage in the hierarchy of computer storage. SSDs perform much faster than a spinning hard drive. However, an SSD's cost per gigabyte, big gigabit, is much higher than a hard drive of comparable capacity. An SSD is typically 2.5 inches wide, but some, uh, some are made for very small laptops and are available in the uh, 1.8 inch wide form factor. Most SSDs connect to the motherboard with SATA interfaces. When any type of SSD is used, an internal or external hard drive can also be used to provide additional storage for apps and data. So here's a side note. A third type of drive, which is known as an SSHD, that combines a small amount of SSD storage with a spinning disk. It is less expensive than an SSD, but provides faster performance than a spinning disk. So just think of it as a combo of a standard hard drive and, the, and what you're looking at on your screen, the SSD. Let's talk about cooling. So computer cooling is required to remove the waste heat produced by computer components to keep the components within permissible operating temperature limits. Components that are susceptible to temperature malfunction or permanent failure if overheated include integrated circuits such as the CPU, chipsets, graphic cards, and hard disk drives. Most desktop computer power supplies have built-in fans and almost all CPUs have active heat sinks, which is a fan combined with a fin cooler. Um, they also have, most systems have additional fans installed to adequately cool the motherboard and the components connected to it. But here's a bit of caution here. If a fan is built into a power supply and the power supply fails, then you need to just replace the entire power supply. Because what happens is there are high voltages that are retained inside of the power supply even when the power is disconnected and those high voltages can injure or kill a person who attempts to replace the power supply fan. So just keep that in mind. If you're messing around with uh, power supplies, do not take those things apart. Just, just don't take them apart. Period. Let's talk about the NIC, which is also known as the network interface card. So a NIC also called an Ethernet card or a network adapter, is a computer expansion card for connecting to a network such as your home network or internet by using an Ethernet cable with a, with a uh, RJ45 connector. Almost every desktop and laptop computer manufactured in the last decade or more includes a network interface card or built-in wired network port. Almost all laptops manufactured in the last decade also include a wireless network card that has antennas built into the frame of the display. Smartphones and tablets also include wireless networking. Wired and wireless Ethernet network adapters can connect to other networks and to the Internet. Let's talk about wired Ethernet. A wired Ethernet port enables a computer to connect to any Ethernet network. All a user has to do is connect the network cable to their computer and the system will be recognized unless the network has been configured to accept connections from only specified devices. When the computer is connected to a network via a wired connection, signal lights on the Ethernet port indicate port speed and connection activity. The amber light indicates the maximum speed signal the port can use that is present and um, the steady and it'll basically present a steady light and the green light, which indicates network activity will blink on and off as the network adapter sends and receives data. The signal lights do not turn on if a working connection is not attached or if the computer is turned off. 
So this is what the uh, network connection on the back of your computer looks like there. Wireless Ethernet. So wireless Ethernet, also known as wireless fidelity or Wi-Fi, requires the user to make some configuration settings on the client device. So here are some of the settings. The user must select the wireless network to connect to uh, to connect to a network or any network in general. They have to provide credentials if required, either when connecting to the network or on a web page that opens automatically. And they have to agree to the conditions of the network. And this is uh, common if you're using public networks in hospitals, hotels, restaurants, etc. Wireless Ethernet is generally slower than wired Ethernet, although the most recent implementation of Wi-Fi 802.11ac offers connection speeds that can exceed gigabit e uh, Ethernet. So here's a chart down here that displays wired versus wire, uh, wireless Ethernet connection speeds. So... Let's talk about when you should use wired or wireless. So when to use wired Ethernet or wireless Ethernet. So you would use wired when a connection with a consistent speed and a secure connection with no user interaction is needed. You would use wireless when a connection is needed in areas where network cabling cannot be used and support for tablets and smartphones as well as computers is necessary. Now, most recent systems with built-in wireless Ethernet also include Bluetooth for short-range data interchange with smartphones and tablets and connections to Bluetooth printers, mice, or keyboards. Let's talk about onboard versus add-on card. So, almost all desktops and laptops have wired Ethernet ports, but many vendors sell replacement NICs. A NIC can provide faster connection speeds than a built-in adapter. And if the onboard adapter is damaged, installing a NIC can enable a computer to continue to be used without a trip to the repair shop. The easiest way to add a desktop computer to a wireless network is to connect to a wireless USB adapter. You can also add a wireless USB adapter to a laptop if its built-in wireless adapter becomes damaged or is no longer suitable because it is too slow or it is not secure enough. To add support for Bluetooth printers, keyboards, or mice to a desktop or laptop that lacks built-in Bluetooth, you could just simply connect a Bluetooth adapter to a USB port. All right, so that is our class. So let's go ahead and do some check on learning, shall we? First question, there are th uh, three of the following motherboard components work together during the startup and hardware configuration process. Select the one that is not involved in this process. So would that be a USB port? Would it be the BIOS firmware? Would it be the CMOS? Or would it be the battery? So three of the following motherboard components work together during the startup and hardware configuration process. Which one of these is not involved in the process, ladies and gentlemen? The correct answer would be the USB port, ladies and gentlemen. The USB port is not involved in the startup and hardware configuration process. Next question. Which of the following statements is correct about the motherboard or the system board? Sometimes Apple refers to it as a logic board. But which of the following is correct? The motherboard includes the power supply. Storage devices are not connected to the motherboard. Some motherboards include video outputs. All motherboards include video output. So which of the following statements is correct? Some motherboards include video outputs is the correct answer, ladies and gentlemen. So if you go back to the question here, the motherboard includes the power supply. That is not always true. Laptops have motherboards and they don't have power supplies that are built directly into the motherboard. Storage devices are not connected to the motherboard. That is not true. 
Storage devices are connected to the motherboard via SATA ports. And all motherboards include video outputs. That is not true. Some motherboards include video outputs. Final question. Your client wants a drive that combines a spinning mechanism with a small amount of SSD storage for better speed. Which of the following do you need to install? Will you install an SST, a SATA, S-A-T-A, S-S-H-D, or E-SATA? So which, which one of these will you install that combines a spinning mechanism with a small amount of SSD storage? It will be SSHD. Remember, SSHD is basically a combination of a standard hard drive that has spinners and platters and a combination of a solid state drive. SSD, which basically is a hard drive built into a circuit board. So you would use you will install an SSHD. All right, so that concludes our class. So in summary, we discussed motherboards and system boards, firmware BIOS. Uh, we talked about some RAM, CPUs, GPUs, and we talked about NICs. For more information, please visit my website, Technology G, so you can get read, read up on the latest and greatest to help you successfully pass your CompTIA IT certification exam. And until next video, peace.